So, Lord, we come to you right now, and we just uh, we thank you for the book of Acts. We thank you that this is the book that uh, reveals how your Holy Spirit breaks out uh, in the new covenant. And, Lord, this is important. This is, this is a big deal. And so I pray that people's hearts would be changed tonight. I pray that there would be... Um, I pray that there would be boldness, and I pray that there would be generosity that comes out of tonight. Uh, I pray for, um, I pray for those two themes that we see in Acts two, Lord. I just pray that throughout this next week, that boldness and generosity would come to the surface in our lives, from the Monday to Saturday instead of just the Sunday. Uh, Lord, we we just pray. For, I pray for that in Jesus' name. In your name, we pray. Amen. Now, as you guys are cycling in um does everybody sitting have a index card anybody not have an index card all right we're good so uh what i want you to do is this is either a um you can use your phone if you'd prefer to use your phone and notes but i know that some people like to go old school and so that's why i got index cards on the one side I want you to write boldness, and then on the other side, I want you to write generosity. And as you're doing that, um, I'm just going to recap a bit of last week, and then we're going to jump straight into Acts 2, and we're going to be in just Acts 2 tonight. We're not, we're not leaving that chapter. Next week, we're going to have to press the gas pedal and move quite a bit faster. But um, I think today it's important for us to just kind of slow down and just sit in Acts 2 because this is a big, big importance. And we can, we can learn a ton from this, uh, from this chapter. So last week we asked the question, okay, uh, we come to the book of Acts. And Acts is, I, I, I told you guys last week, I said the Bible is not written to you. And some looked at me like, Okay, who is this guy and why is he standing in front, right? But it's true. The Bible was not written to you. It's written for you. The, the, this specific book is written to a guy named Theophilus. And Theophilus, most likely, we talked about last week, is the Roman official that is going to be presiding over Paul's court case um, in 62 AD when uh, he's supposed to be before Nero. But at this time, Nero, uh, Emperor Nero, is is most likely a... Um, still on a basically a, a pleasure binge, uh, and he's not really concerned about running the empire, so other people would be doing that job. Theophilus means one loved by God, um, and so the both books, Luke and Acts, are written uh, to this same man. Uh, so it's, uh, oh, and pens, we got pens. Anybody need pens? Close your eyes and there we go. <laughs> Gold. Hey, Morag. There you go. You're welcome. And so the, the, the thing that I just wanted to get everybody's head around was the fact that the Jewish nation at this time is being run by the Roman Empire. We went back to Daniel, and we went back to the reason why Daniel is in exile is because the Jewish people would not stop their idolatry, Okay. The nation of Israel would not stop worshiping idols. And God finally brought the hammer down on them in 586 B.C. and said, you're going to Babylon. And Babylon came, took them, and, and took them away in a very, very painful, um, in a very, very painful way and settled them in a nation hundreds and hundreds of miles away from their home. Well, they lived in that nation for 70 years. And during that time, Daniel was one of the uh, key advisors to both King Nebuchadnezzar and then the Persian king later on. But what he said was, uh, he, he, he interprets a dream, and he says there's going to be four different uh, nations that are going to, to, to arise. Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and finally Rome. And Rome is the worst of the worst. Okay, they're the ones that smash and crush and crunch, right? And so what happens is, by the time you get to the first century, everybody is being crushed by Roman oppression. Now, if you're being crushed by Roman oppression, that means that we talked about last week, you know, in, uh, it was in 4 A.D. where the emperor killed uh, 2,000 people by, by execution via crucifixion on the way into Palestine and Judea. Now, 
when you walk past all those bodies, that, that, that puts a deep imprint in your mind, right? And you end up hating this people. And that's exactly where the Jews were. I mean, we talked about it in the, in the even bef- right before the, the, um, the disciples see Jesus ascend into heaven. The, one of their last questions is, okay, is it now when you're going to uh, finally make everything right? When you're going to restore the kingdom of, it, kingdom of Israel? And basically he says, no, that's not you. That's not for you to know. But you will receive power. Stay in Jerusalem and you're going to receive power. And so at this point, um, we walk through, uh, they, they go back, they, they're a united, like you think about those guys. You got Simon, who's a zealot, okay, he, he's, all he's interested in before Jesus is killing people. You got Matthew, who has turned his back on his own people and he's collecting money for this foreign power that is the oppressing power. You have Peter, who's a fisherman, who's probably a shyster, and he, you know, he's just the guy who is always putting his foot in his mouth. Right, so you can imagine each one of these guys has a, has a different personality and problem. Now, by this time, what you see when you get to Acts 2 is, and even in the end of Acts 1, is they're united, which means they've had three years with Jesus, and a lot of those rough edges have been honed. And you see them really starting in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit falls. Like, they're, they're in lockstep. Like, th- they, they've got it. Okay, something clicked. And so... The end of Acts, you know, we, we talked about Justice and Matthias, or Matthias, however you want to pronounce it. And Matthias is picked, uh, Justice isn't. And what's going through his head at that moment? Okay, am I, I feel worthless. I don't, am I, I'm not worthy of being picked to be in that crowd. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, you go through the I'm nots or the, I'm the value. Like, I don't have as much value. I don't have as much worth. I don't have, whatever, I'm not as loved. And then we went to Hebrews, and we said that in Hebrews 12, he says the, the, Lord, um, uh, the Lord basically sets a path for each person, right? And so my path is different than your path, and your path is different than your path. The goal is the same. It gets to Jesus, but God has given all of us different talents and abilities to get to where we're going, which means we're all unique, okay? He has different callings on all, on every, everybody's life has a different calling is what I'm trying to say. And so then we moved into a time of repentance, and that was really cool. Today we come to Acts 2. Okay? So I'm going to read just a little bit of Acts 2, and we're going we're gonna to get going. It says in Acts 2, verse 1, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Now I read that sentence, that verse, and I see obedience. Okay? If this is in the middle of the Gospels, Jesus is still having to kind of herd the cats. Right. But right here, what you see is Jesus tells them, do not leave Jerusalem. And what you see here is when they arrived, they were all together in one place. And as they're in one place, what are they doing? Well, it says they're they're praying at this point. And it says, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared on them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, I've tried to imagine this day so many times. What, you know, what, what, what was actually going on? Because when Holy Spirit breaks out, it's like the fear of the Lord shows up. You have a tornado that opens up in this house, okay? I'm imagining tables are being flipped between people trying to dive under them and the wind picking it up and throwing it against the wall. Pots and pans are going everywhere. If there's paper, that kind of stuff, it's, <laughs> you know, it's just gone over everything, right? And w- divided, all of a sudden you look at your buddy and your buddy's head's on fire, and now you're speaking in different languages, okay? Now, as this happens, these guys all spill out onto the street, and you're going to read in a second that it's like they think that they're hammered, like that this is a frat party that has gone way too long, Right? And Peter's going to kind of set it straight. But when I think about this, um, when you think about this, the tongues are speech. Okay, It's just speech that it's talking about. And fire is God's purifying presence. So God is doing a new thing. Okay, This is, this is a brand new thing. He says, now there, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And the sound of the multitude came together. So you have devout men coming together that are from like, what we're going to find, they're from like basically 
just all of earth. They're from everywhere. And, and then there's the multitude. So you have, you have a combination of devouts and then the multitudes. They come together and they ask this question. And it says they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Okay, so I'm going to use the English language as an example. Okay? Now, I am I'm a foreigner. Okay? I'm not Australian. I don't know if you could tell that by the way I sound, but it turns out I'm not Australian. Uh, I hope to one day hold the passport, but we'll, we'll, we're praying that in. Uh, got some good friends that are helping me pray that in. Um, but here's the deal. It would be like someone speaking Mandarin and it changing in the air to where I hear it in Chicago-style English and you hear it in southeastern Queensland English. Okay? That's nuts. That's crazy. Now, if I take that and I say, I, there's some Cana- if there's a Canadian in the room, no doubt about it, right? There's like, it would be, they would be hearing it in their Canadian tongue. If you're talking England, you got London, Manchester, all the different, all, I mean, there's so many different uh, dialects coming from London. Not to mention, if you go to Scotland or Ireland, I've had, we've had Scottish and Irish students come in. I'm telling you, it takes a while to be able to understand what they're saying. You know, pass the fleur. What, what is fleur? The fleur. Oh, flower, flower. Yeah, fleur. Right? Like, I, I, th- I had that with one of, our, one of our students. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is tough. So you're hearing it not only in your own language, but in your dialect. Okay? Out of just 12 guys that have looked like a drunken party has just fallen out of this house, and you're hearing this from your language that is from back home. It says, they say, and are not all these speaking Galileans? How is it that they hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians and Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cap- Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Figria and, and uh, Palamphria, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Ara- Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked them, saying they were filled with new wine. Okay, so you can see this is, you could totally just see this just happening. Like if you're a fly on the wall and you're watching this happen, these 12 guys, first of all, everything's blowing out of the windows, right? If they're in the upper room, okay, whatever the windows were, there's stuff coming out of them because a tornado just went through there. And as that happens, so you're kind of backing up because, you know, a table just landed and there's papers falling over here. And then these guys come out and you're speaking. And as they're speaking, you're hearing this in your own dialect from all of those different places. And the two conclusions that they come to is, um, what does this mean? Which, when you think about that, um, is just a simple question. What does this mean? And the second thing is, they got to be hammered. These boys got to be hammered. Now, at this point, Peter stands up. And I want you to just think about this because the length from when Peter at Passover denies Jesus he denies Jesus and it was a slave girl that says you were one of them no I wasn't on the third time he calls down a curse on himself right you know how long it was from when Jesus was killed to when Pentecost comes and Peter gives The sermon of his life. Fifty days. Fifty days. You know how long ago fifty days was? It was December sixteenth. What were you doing on December sixteenth, twenty twenty? I'll tell you what you were doing on December sixteenth. You were frantically shopping. You were frantically shopping for your family and friends, trying to get trying to get the last, or the, I would say, maybe the 16th, you're still in the responsible category. Probably the 23rd would be you're frantically shopping, right? But you're shopping for gifts for family and friends. You're thinking, what am I going to serve on Christmas Eve? What am I going to serve on Christmas Day? What are we doing on New Year's Eve? I can't wait for 2020 to be over. This is what your mind's going through. We can go back 50 days, right? Look at the transformation that happens to Peter in 50 days. He goes 
from being a basically a complete pansy to giving the sermon of his life. And as we go through the sermon, you're going you're gonna to see what I mean. Now, this should bring hope to everybody. Because when the Holy Spirit enters you, things change. Right? So he says, Peter standing with the 11. Actually, you know what? Um, there's, I go to a, a church in Bly Bly. Um, and we started going to that church because we lived in Bly Bly. Um, and it's, it's this little church called River Life. We, we operate out of, uh, out of the Bly Bly State School. And uh, my pastor, uh, you know, I'm in a men's group there. And um, for a long time, we were praying for his son, his 23-year-old son, Jesse. And uh, he's actually put YouTubes on this out. Like, he's, he's, he is all about telling this, so this isn't divulging anything confidential. But, you know, he was, he was just involved in drugs and, and all, just, you know, ev- everything south, everything going wrong. And we're praying and we're praying and we're praying. There's another group this group and they have this thing called fire nights and basically it's just a bunch of teenagers at this point early 20s who are just worshiping and seeking the god seeking god and holy spirit just starts doing holy spirit stuff well one of these nights jesse shows up and he gets a demon cast out of him just boom that turned him around he is the biggest evangelist and he's been for the last year and a half he has been an evangelist he's uh He's discipling people. He's, he's just all about telling his story and telling about what Jesus did inside of him. I look at this, and I think that's the power of Holy Spirit when Holy Spirit falls on someone, right? Gets rid of the gunk, and it's just like people fall in love with Jesus. And so uh, this is Peter. It says, it, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed him. He said, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Basically, he goes, hey, boys. Listen up, okay? You need to listen to what I'm going to say. He says, for it is, uh, for these people are not drunk as you suppose since the third hour of the day. Okay, it's 9 a.m. Okay, these 12, I mean, I understand there's, there's problems, but these 12, they're, this, is not, this is not the drunken frat party. Okay, this is, a, this is a big deal with what's happening right now. He says, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. It says, and in the last days, and this is a, a direct quote from Joel 2, 28 to 32 that he quotes here. He says, in the last days, I sh- it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants, and in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, that great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so this is, we can read that and we go, wow, the prophet, Joel, and this is is the prophet, and he's looking that way, okay? And what he's seeing is he's seeing this as one event, okay? He writes it as one event. Now, as Peter says here, this is what's happening. And as we read back on it, when the prophet speaks, we actually see this as two events. Because he's talking about here in the first half about, um, about people um, prophesying and dreams and all that. This is the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then it goes to, and the, 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 the sun is darkened and the moon turned to blood. Okay, that's... That's heavy, okay? That's what we call second coming language. So this is second coming language. And the space in between here and here, that's what we don't know, okay? If anybody does tell you they know, they're lying to you, okay? Just flat out. This is what we call the church age, okay? The time in between. So part of this has been fulfilled, but the second coming aspect has not. So, uh, and this is what we call, uh, this is what biblical scholars will call telescoping. So the prophet sees, sees something, he describes it, and then uh, the New Testament will show that this is actually, well, this is two events, but they're separated by a huge span of time. Um, anyway, 
He says, uh, and he says right here, it says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So how do you get saved? By calling on the name of the Lord. Right? Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works, wonders, and signs. Okay, mighty works, wonders, and signs. Okay, Lazarus was raised from the dead. Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. Uh, the woman who's been bleeding for 12 years just touches the hem of his garment. Bam! Power shoots out. She's healed instantly. And then he has compassion on her and hears her story as Jairus is patiently waiting, tapping his foot, thinking his daughter's going to, you know, Jesus, like, we have more important things to do than listen to this woman. But Jesus, of course, in his time, listens and hears this woman out, hears her pain, and then goes and raises Jairus' daughter from the dead, right? What else does he do? He heals leprosy. He brings blindness, exactly, heals blindness. He heals deafness, right? Like many signs and wonders. John says in his gospel that if we wrote it all down, there wouldn't be enough books in the, uh, books in the world to contain everything that Jesus did. So they're, they're, they're picking very, like, just, uh, just a couple things that Jesus did in the, in the four Gospels. So y what, he, what he's saying here is, uh, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you uh, by God with mighty works, signs, and wonders. Everybody there knows about Jesus, okay? Everybody would have known what had happened 50 days ago. This is not like, this is not like a side thing. Everybody in Jerusalem was turned upside down at the crucifixion. Okay, this, this is a huge deal, huge deal. He says that God, uh, signs, uh, wonders and signs that God did through him in the midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to his definite plan and foreknowledge, you crucified and killed by hands of lawless men. When's the last time you said that in your evangelism That you crucified Jesus. What? I didn't crucify Jesus. Yeah, well, those people didn't put the nails in his hands necessarily. And Peter's saying, yeah, you did. You crucified Jesus. Why? Because of your sin. Because of my sin. It's our sin that put him on the cross. Now, when I think about this, I think, man, at Passover, Jesus is completely denying him. And now he's standing up in front of at least 3,000 people. And he's saying, you're the one that actually killed him. You crucified him. Now, he doesn't leave him there. He says, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held down by it. Okay? So God is raised. Now, here's, here's the thing. You can go, you take Caesars, okay, who proclaim to be God. You take the Caesars, you go to any tomb, you can find their bones. You find Muhammad, you can find his bones. You dig down far enough, you're going to get him. Buddha, you're going to find his bones. You can't find the bones of Jesus because he didn't stay in the ground, right? Because he was raised from the dead. Now he says, I saw this, uh, David says concerning him. So this is David speaking to him. He says, I saw the Lord always before me. For is he at the right, he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced and my flesh will dwell in hope. For you, uh, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. So David understands. He's been given this, this insight that he, is, um, he won't dwell in Hades. He, so he's going to be with Jesus. And he knows that the anointed one coming after him won't see corruption, meaning he won't sin. He says, you have made known the paths of life and you will make uh, full the gladness of your presence. And this is a quote from Psalm 16, 8 through 11. So Peter quotes that, and then he says this. He says, brothers, I might say to you with confidence about the, our patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In other words, if you want, we can march over to the tomb, open it up, find David's bones, and just, you know, bring him out. We could do that. But he says this. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. So David in this section is speaking up about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That he was not abandoned to Hades, nor that his flesh would see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and 
of that, we are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand and having been received by the Father with the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured this out uh, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Okay? When you're seated at the right hand, anytime you see angels in the Old Testament that are next to God, so you see, an, you see it in Isaiah, you see angels around, uh, angels around the throne, throne room in Isaiah, you see it in Ezekiel, you see it in several different places. They're always standing. The sun is sitting until the, foot, until the earth is made a footstool, okay? So what he's saying there is the sun is by sitting, that, that act of sitting next to the father shows equality, okay? The only person that sits in, in, in that is royalty. So the person you put on the cross is actually the God of everything. It says, the, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That's a quote from Psalm 110.1. It says, let the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. So if he's made him Lord and Christ or Lord and Messiah. And you crucified him. And by the way, this is backed up by all 12 of us falling out of the house, standing up and preaching the mighty works of God and you hearing it in your own dialect. You thought we were drunk. No, we weren't drunk. We're speaking to you and something supernatural is happening in this moment. And what I'm going to tell you is that it's actually it's you and your sin that put Jesus on the cross. Now, this message hits home. Okay, this message doesn't just just like fall flat. This message hits home hard. It says, now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? Like, what, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of your sins, that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. So this promise is for all of you here. It's for your children, whether your children are here or maybe back home where they are. And then all who are far off. Who are those that are far off? Gentiles. Right? Everyone whom God calls to himself. So Jew and Gentile alike. Right? He says, and with many other words, he bore witness and he continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Good thing that doesn't still apply today. Oh, wait. Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received this word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, it's interesting when you look at this, and we're going to end with this verse here, and we're going to take a break. Um, when the law was given in Exodus 20, uh, basically from Exodus 20 to 32 to 31, what you have is just a whole bunch of law that's given. And in Exodus 32, you have the, the, the golden calf incident. And so God taps Moses on the shoulder and says, hey, you got to go back downstairs. Uh, people are kind of getting dumb. So he goes back downstairs, and sure enough, and so it's, he, he says, who's, who's going to stand with me? And the sons of Levi come to Moses. And Moses, with the authority of God, says to the sons of Levi, Strap on your sword and go kill your brother and your neighbors. Basically, everyone that's, that's, that's been a part of this, slay them. And they do it. How many people do they kill? 3,000. So when the law is given, when the law which reveals sin, 3,000 people die. When the spirit is given, 3,000 people live. Ephesians 2, you were dead. Now you are alive in Christ, Right? That's the beauty of having Jesus in your heart is because you're alive. And so I have thought about this, this portion of Scripture, and I've thought um, uh, standing up and evangelizing 
with the boldness that Peter had can only happen if we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because what he just did took a lot of guts. Because 50 days prior, he's in a corner getting called out by a schoolgirl. 50 days later, he's in front of 3,000 people, and it said they were cut to the heart, and he tells them twice, you were the one that crucified him. And so take out that note card, that note card that I gave you. If you don't, did you guys get note cards? I got you. There you go. There's a few more in case you got more names. And I want you to write down at least one name of someone that you're going to tell Jesus about this week. Maybe it's two names. Maybe it's three names. I'm asking you for just one that you're going to share Jesus to this week. So next week when I'm standing up here again, you will have told that person about Jesus. So I'm going to, so just everybody bow your heads and I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that God brings the right person to mind for you. Lord Jesus, we have a room tonight filled with evangelists, filled with people who want to know you. There's no other reason why they would come to this building and hear this bald-headed American talk from the front. There's no other reason except they love you. And they want to see others fall in love with you as well. Lord, would you please bring names to mind? Coworkers, family, neighbors. People from their past. I pray that you would bring names, Jesus. And I pray tonight that you would give each one of these guys crazy, ridiculous boldness when they go and they share about your death, your resurrection, and your ascension. And that the battle has been won. Lord, maybe these people are really, really concerned about the geopolitical politics that are happening. And the fact is that it's not going to get any better. It's just going to get worse. But those principalities and powers that are governing that, Jesus, you're above it. And that there's hope that you're above it. And I pray that that hope gets shared. So, Lord, I just pray that those names come to mind. I pray that they end up on the paper, and I pray that the message of the gospel gets sent out from this room. And in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, why don't we take, why don't we come back at um, 745? That's like eight minutes from now. And we'll smash out, um, smash out some more. Sound good? Sweet as.
All right, well, let's bring it in. So, Lord, we come to you right now, and we just, uh, I just pray for the rest of tonight. Holy Spirit, that you would be working in our hearts and in our minds. Uh, Lord, as we've prayed for boldness to go, uh, for basically boldness to be on us as we share the gospel to those who don't know it, whether it's coworkers or family, sometimes family is the hardest, uh, former friends, current friends. Jesus, we just pray for that. And Lord, as we move into the second half here, I just pray that um, generosity would be a marking, that we would be marked by generosity. So Lord, we I give this uh, the next bit of time to you. I pray that you would open our hearts uh, as you opened Lydia's heart in Acts 16 to hear the words that were said by Paul. Lord, I pray for that gentle opening tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, um, if you look at, I told you at the beginning that we are going to be in Acts chapter 2, and we only have to do 42 to 47. So we're almost done with the chapter. <laughs> Woo! All right. So, um, first of all, before we get into that, any questions about anything that we've went through, we've gone through so far? In verse 41, it says, So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And I did the math. That would be 250 people for each disciple to baptize in one day. Possible. They'd be tired at the end. Or 500 if there were two of them. Like, there's a lot of people to dunk. Okay? Okay. But they did it. So how long did that take? Okay. I don't know. Did it take a couple days? I mean, everybody's got to get to a place of water, wherever the place of water was. Everybody had to get down there. The disciples had to get down there. You know, you think of food, kids screaming, animals. I mean, you put everything into that mix. How long does this take? I don't know. But it just says that they were baptized. And then there's the word and. And and is a connective. So... The word and is connecting the previous thought with the thought that's coming up. So the previous thing is 3,000 people get saved through this crazy thing, right? And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now, there's been many people, and I've, I've had people come through. It's like, okay, we want to redo church. Okay, I don't like... You know, when, when I was growing up, it was like, we had to have drums in church, okay? So eventually, like, the organ went away and the drums came back, or the drums showed up on stage. There was the electric guitar that showed up, and then, um, uh, so, you know, some people want to go, let's, let's, like, not do the big church. Let's go back to small church. Let's go back to the original church. Let's go. And so it's like, what, what is church? What does church look like? And so Acts 2 actually tells us what the first century church was. But here's the deal. None of us are first century Jews. Fair enough statement? Okay. Might be Jewish, but we're not first century Jewish. Now, why do I say that? Let me go to another passage to kind of explain what I mean. In Romans 16, 16, it says, Greet one another 
with a holy kiss. Where's mine? Everyone came in here tonight and I got none. Okay? Now here's the deal. If you're in a French church or you're in a Middle Eastern church, that actually is the appropriate greeting. Okay? If that, <laughs> not during COVID, yeah. If you give that greeting in the southern state of Texas, if I were to give that greeting to someone's wife in the southern state of Texas, I'm going to leave with a few missing teeth. Okay? So here's what I propose. Because I've been to several countries. Um, if you go to Thailand, or you go to Cambodia, you go to Japan, I've been to all three of those nations. You pull Romans 16, 16, and you're gone. You're done. You're getting on a plane, and you're getting sent home immediately. Okay? Why? Well, because their culture is that men and women don't, if it, men and women just do not, there's no physical contact, period. Okay? You, 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 you bow. That's, that's just how it is. In America, you come up, and you kind of put your hand in, and you do like the, the bro hug. You know what I mean? You, we do it here, too. It's the bro hug. You know, when a woman comes up, you kind of give her the side hug, okay? That's how, that's how uh, proper greeting is. And so when we read Romans 16, 16, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Okay, he's specifically talking as a Jewish person to a Roman audience in first century. And so what we have to do is we have to actually interpret what is he trying to communicate there? Well, let me argue that it's not the kiss part, Okay. What he's saying is he wants you to greet your fellow Christians in the name of Jesus with affection and love. Now, in Thailand, that means, that means you give a bow, and that is the proper greeting. In France, you might do the, the cheek thing, right? In the Middle East, you probably do the kiss thing. In America, you're going to do the bro hug, or maybe if it's more formal, it's just a solid handshake in a, in a, in a good morning. God loves you, right? That's what he's getting across there. So sometimes we have to actually interpret what's being said. So when we look at this and we see this is how they did church in the beginning, what we want to get through, what we want to get to is what is the timeless truth that is behind the, what they're actually doing. Because I'm telling you right now that some of this, like they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We can't do that. Because they're dead. We can do their writings, but not their teeth. Like, like to actually sit down and hear Peter, James, or John give a sermon, we just simply can't do that because too much time is gone and they've, they're just they're in the ground. So I call this the four things. Really technical name. The first four things, okay? Because there's going to be two sets of four things in the last couple of verses here. So the first bit of four things is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And they devoted themselves to the fellowship. They broke bread together and the prayers. Okay? So let's just take this step by step. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles would have taught uh, their teaching. We see in later chapters that they're teaching in the uh, temple. They're teaching everywhere they go. In fact, there's so much, te they have to teach so much because they were the ones that were around Jesus for three years. Now, they have to teach so much, but there's also other kinds of things that have to get done, like, like, like food distribution, okay? Um, and so they pick the seven deacons, and which of Stephen is one of them, a man filled with the Holy Spirit. When he dies, his face glows like an angel, okay? He has a different calling than the apostles. The goal is the end. The goal is Jesus. But his route that he takes through life is different. And so what you see here is the, the apostles were, uh, were the teachers. They were the ones that, that taught people originally how. And it was all done orally. Eventually, some of their stuff got put down onto paper. And that's where we have our New Testament. Okay? So we can go to the scriptures and we can read about them. And that's what we do. And God says, that's good. But we actually can't listen to the apostles' teaching as they did in the first century because they're dead. The fellowship. The first, I've often heard it said that the first rung in fellowship is friendship. Okay? So as believers and as this group of people has gotten together, 
They are fellowshipping, which is it's a deep, deep level of friendship, for lack of better words. It's, there is a depth of relationship there that you can only have, I would argue, with another Christian. Because you hold Jesus in common. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Then they have the breaking of bread. Okay? The breaking of bread that happens, that they do together, they're doing in Jerusalem, and there's devout men from all around the whole world that are there, and then the masses, and it's the blend of those of that crew that get saved. And so you have people from out of town that would be encouraging, or you have people that are living in Jerusalem that are having people from out of town into their home, and they're, they're uh, breaking bread together, okay? We can call this hospitality. And this is something that we can also do today. It just looks a little different than it did in the first century. And finally, the prayers. Now, first century, we read just a little bit further. Uh, it's going to be the next chapter in Acts. Peter and John are going to the, uh, to the temple to pray at the proper time. There's three times during the day that you would pray at the temple that a, that a observant Jew would do that. Uh, three times that they could, at least. And so... Um, they, and they would do that at the temple. Okay, we don't have the temple anymore. We now are the temple of, Hol of the Holy Spirit. So the way that we pray and the way that the Jewish people would pray uh, in early days is just, it looks, it looks different. Now, what's, what's the sameness? Okay, we're, we're both listening to the same teaching on Jesus. They heard it orally. We have it written down. We fellowship. It looks a little different because we're in Nambor. They're in Jerusalem. Fair enough? Break bread together. What does that mean? How do you break bread with one another? In my church growing up, what we would do sometimes is um, everybody would bring a, uh, basically a plate of food, right? And then at the end, the pastor would say, there's a potluck downstairs in the basement of the church. And you'd know that when you went down there, every grandma has made their most delicious meal. And it's just all you want to do is just eat, eat, eat eat. You just wish you're like a cow with seven stomachs or however many. At least that's how I felt because I just wanted to eat, 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 and eat. That's one way. Another way is to have people over at your home, to have people into your home. And what happens when you have people into your home, when your friends from church who are Christians, they come over and they hang out with you? Well, I'll tell you what happens. You fellowship, okay? You talk about things that you hold in common. You talk about your kids, their kids, your struggles, their struggles, successes, their successes, hurts, their hurts. Like all that comes out, and what happens is your relationship equity with fellowship goes up. And finally, the prayers. It's really important that we as Christians pray and pray together. We don't do it nearly enough. But the encouragement here is to do it. And so where it looks different, I would say the timeless truth that comes out of all of this is that we need to be hearing good teaching. We have, there's a, there's a great, um, a legend, his name is Neville, and he comes up from Byron Bay. He's been a, he's been a pastor down there for over 30 years. Um, and he's, he's just one of these guys that has the gift of knowledge, like the gift of knowledge of like soaking in knowledge and just being able to make the connections. The guy is absolutely brilliant. Whenever he teaches, I call him the machine gun teacher because it's just like you're just like, and you're just getting blown apart as he's rattling things off at, you know. And so he, he comes and he made this offhanded comment one year that has always stuck with me. He said, there are so many problems that can be avoided in church simply by good teaching. Imagine that. So many problems can be avoided by your congregation, by, by the congregation, by the people there, with simply good teaching. And we've had bad teaching with YWAM. We've had bad teaching come into our mission. We've had bad teaching come onto our base here on Sunny Coast. And when that happened, it, it, was, it was very destructive. But how did we fight it? We fought it with good teaching. Okay? That's how you fight that stuff. You go straight, straight to the scripture to fight it. Fellowship. We can fellowship with one another. How do we do that? What's, what's one way of doing it? Well, we can, we can eat together. That's, that's a very good way. Whether it's on a Sunday afternoon and a picnic in the, in the yard over here, or it's, if it's at your house, right? 
And when you do that, that's an act of generosity, which I'm going to lead into here in a minute, and followed by the prayer. So the verse that I stuck on here, it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And it says in verse 43, and awe came upon every soul. And many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. So in between these two four things, you have awe. And then I would argue what's actually happening here when you read between the lines is this church is walking in unity. And really, for the first several chapters, for chapters 2, 3, and 4, you don't see anything go sideways in the church. You see problems externally coming in, but you don't see anything go sideways in in the church until the beginning of chapter 5. In chapter 5, at the end of chapter 4, you have Barnabas who sold the field, and he brings his money, and he gives it to the poor, right? So that the money can be uh, distributed. Well, Ananias and Sapphira see all the all the accolades that old boy Barnabas just got. And so they're like, we're going to do the same thing, but we're just going to keep a little bit. And if they would have said, we're giving 70, whatever the percentage, 70%, but we're going to keep back 30%, there's no problem. But they said, we're giving it all while keeping some back. And God literally kills both of them just hours apart. Okay. So what, what, what's happening there? You have jealousy that, preach, that, that creeps into the church. Okay, you have, oh, I want to be like him. I want to be like that, which that's the part we got to stay away from. But up to this point, we have unity that's holding this together. And then after that verse, we have what I like to call the second four things, my very creative titles. And it says this. And all who believed together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending to the temple, their breaking of bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay. So what does the first century church also do? They hold everything in common. Can I go home in your car tonight? (laughs) Can I sleep in your bed? (laughs) I mean, that's what holding everything in common means. Like, your stuff is my stuff, my stuff is your stuff. Okay? This is where, we like, as Westerners, like, whoa, let's put on the brakes there. Okay? I kind of start to like this first century. It was in the past bit. They sold all their possessions and they gave it all to everybody who had need. Is God calling us today to sell everything and then give it all away? Hmm, I don't know. I don't know. They attended the temple. Okay? That temple doesn't exist. In 70 AD it was crushed. And then they were breaking bread in their homes. So there's this connection back to breaking of bread which I would argue breaking bread in homes, that's, that's an act of generosity. Holding everything in common, not being worried about things, that is generosity. Selling possessions and giving to all who had need so that no one was in need, that is an act of generosity. What's the fruit? The fruit was they had glad, or the result, I should say, the, they had glad and generous hearts. Do you want that? Do you want a glad and generous heart? Walk in generosity. What's the result, then, of having glad and generous hearts? What does God do for them? Well, God added to their number, which is salvations, day by day. More and more people are getting saved because they're seeing, these people are acting ridiculous, and I love it. And because of that, God is blessing them. So here's the... Here's, here's kind of a bit on, on generosity, because this is the second part I had you write on your card. Um, if you look at in Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, 
I'm going to read verses 1 to 4. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Okay? Jesus says that. Now, I'm going to read another passage where it seems like this is contradicting. And I'm going to read it, and I'm going to say I don't think it's contradicting. Um, one, because it's, it's in here. But I think there's a different, a different angle that we're looking at it. And so I just kind of want to bring some clarity. So in First Chronicles, First uh, Chronicles 29, uh, 1 to 5, it says this. And David, the king, said to the assembly. So David is standing before the assembly. Everybody is hearing what David is about to say. He says, Solomon, my son, whom, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great. For the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of God so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, bronze for the things of bronze, iron for the things of iron, wood for the things of wood, and besides great quantities of onyx and stones for setting. And he kind of goes into marbles and stones. And then in verse 5, 5b, he says, uh, he says this, who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord. And then it gives a list of, uh, of the people who came forward and, and their offering amount. Now, in this offering, in 4, verse 4, it says, he gave 3,000 talents of gold, 7,000 talents of refined silver. This is the second of two different offerings that David gave. In the first offering, in First Chronicles 22, he gives 100,000 talents of gold, okay, and a million talents of silver. And then in this offering, he gives 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of silver. So you're going, that's great, J.D. What's a talent? A talent is 34 kgs. Okay? So I did the math. Actually, the last thing I did... My wife was not home tonight, and I was in the middle of, uh, I had actually just gotten dressed, and I, I was doing all the calculations because I love num like these kind of numbers. The gift that David gave was in Australian dollars, he gave just a little under $307 billion to the temple. That's his gift. That's a gift. That's, that's big, okay? So David, in this, in this moment, is teaching his people how to give. He says, this is what I'm going to give. What are you going to give? Right? So fast forward to Jesus, and Jesus says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, if we just hear that, okay, I, I, I don't think it was meant to be heard in that way. He also says, don't sound the trumpet. Don't blow your own horn, okay? Don't be, uh, when you give, it's okay to give. Give in secret. Do exactly what Jesus did. Don't demand that your name be put on the wall, right? Don't, that th this building was built by so-and-so, and, 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 and this happened here, and that this happened here. However... How are people to learn how to give if they're not taught? And so I think First Chronicles gives us the approval to stand up and say, okay, this is how you give. This is how it's done. Now, in Luke, specifically Luke 6.38, it says, Give, 
And this is Jesus talking. He says, give and it will be given to you. Running over, pressed down with full measure that you give it will be given back to you. Now, there's this thing called the prosperity gospel where if you give, God is going to make you a gazillionaire. And that's garbage. 100%. However, I would say that when you give, you can't outgive God. And God loves a cheerful giver. Okay? In Acts 20, 35, he's quoting Jesus. Paul is quoting Jesus, and he says this. He says, as our Lord Jesus said, you are more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I know what it's, I'm a missionary. Okay? I live on people giving money to me from back in the States. That's how I'm able to stay here in country. I'm going to give you an example of what it feels like to receive. And then I'm going to talk about what, it's, what giving is. I have a friend, her name's Mary. She was friends with my mom. My mom passed away uh, just about two years ago. She was really tight with my mom. And Mary uh, got married at a young age, was not a believer, and her husband left her. Uh, I don't know much about that story. I just know that he left her. So they divorced. She remarried this guy named Jim, and she was not a believer at that point. And she had two kids, Alex and Emily. Uh, in that process of, of um, basically bringing up two kids, she becomes a Christian, and she becomes friends with my mom. Uh, over a period of time, unfortunately, her husband, Jim, left her. Now, that's an unequally yoked relationship, and Paul says in 1 Corinthians that when that happens, just let the other person go. It's okay. okay so it's, 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 not, it's not on you, right? And so that, she, she, and she has never remarried since. Um, and so she's bringing up little Alex and little Emily living in a town, and she's basically working at, uh, at a makeup counter at the, like, in, in the plaza. And so she's the person that, you know, takes the, f you know, put, puts the, the pretties on the ladies' faces. It's the best I can say it, right? I know that might be inconsiderate, but that's what I say. Just, you make, just, yeah. And so... And she's brilliant at it. But that's not a high-paying job. And she's, I mean, she's, she's a coupon clipper. She goes to get the deals. She, she goes to different stores to get different things to, that are on sale. Like, that's how she lives. And then I come home and I say, yeah, I'm joining YWAM. And she leaves and she does the, she does, she does the missionary handshake. Have you ever, you guys know what that is? It's where someone will roll up a bill or a check. And they'll come up to you and they'll just shake your hand at the end. And then as they shake their hand, they just kind of, they leave that little in there. And what that is, is, is doing exactly what, what Luke 6 says. Like, give in secret. Like, that, that's applying that in the right way. Right? And I'm thinking to my head, boy, I'm, I'm so thankful for the 50 bucks you gave me. That's, that's what's in my head. I open up that check for it. It was for $1,000. And I'm thinking. Now, I know what it feels like to feel on the receiving end. And I am blessed by the receiving. Like, that bought a plane ticket, right? Th th that's what that money did for, for my wife and I. Well, let me just say that Mary is the one that's more blessed in that story because she's actually the one that wrote the check and gave that money. So when you give, you're actually more blessed. Now, in I'm, I'm 40. Uh, when I was in my late 20s, uh, my mentor, his name is Dr. Ron Smith. Uh, he looks at me, and he's he's a huge gener generosity guy. You get him going on generosity, you're here, you're not leaving until at least 1 a.m. Okay. Ron tells me, he says, JD, he goes, I believe that you have a ministry of generosity. And he's, I'm like 28 when he says this, and I have no idea what he's talking about. As time has progressed, I've seen what this means, and. What it means is, there's, there's several facets, I would say, but one is, is being able to teach generosity. Uh, and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell you a couple stories. And these stories are told for the purpose of your edification and for teaching you and for encouraging you. This is not a pat on the back for JD. I'm saying that from the front. Okay, 
So I'm going to explain a couple things and then how God worked through those things. So our base in Montana, our YWAM base, said we're going to do a giving day. Okay, what's a giving day? I've never done one of these before. So they stood up and the Monday morning, they said, okay, on Thursday, we're going to do giving day. Monday morning staff meeting, Thursday is going to be giving day. I said, okay, what's giving day? Well, giving day is where you pray and then you come to the meeting and then whatever God told you to give away, you give it away. I'm like, oh, that's pretty simple. So like I really wanted to get in my head because Ron's, Ron's talking to me about generosity. So I'm like, okay, I want to do this right. <coughs> and I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to hold everything like this. And he said, I said, whatever you want me to give, I'll give. And so there were four things that came up. The first was um, some money. The second was a Gibson Epiphone 12-string guitar that I bought when I was 16 years old off the money that I had made when I worked at Denny's. Okay? Just basically being a waiter. The third thing was a a Mossberg 550 12-gauge shotgun. Now, you can't do that here, okay? But in Montana, you can do that. And the fourth thing that I felt like the Lord was telling me to give away was my truck. And so I went to my wife, and I said, babe, this is kind of what I'm feeling. She's like, do it. And it's super encouraging. I was like, all right. Now, you got to understand that my son, who's about five at the time, Jack, is loves my truck because we go on the bumpy roads on these dirt roads right and i just you know basically strap him in as hard as i can and then we just hit the roads fast and and he just absolutely loves it and so i went down we, we all went down as a family and uh they're one of our family friends uh that were at the meeting as well they're trying to adopt a child and i don't know what it costs in australia but in the states it's about forty thousand dollars to adopt a kid Okay, it's ridiculous. You can board them like this, but if you want to, if you want to adopt them, it takes a gazillion dollars. So the money, the mon monetary amount that we gave was a grand. So I had a grand in cash, put it into an envelope, sealed it up, and just went, "Here you go, John." I put it in his lap, and kind of went over his worshiping. I'm like, "Lord, who do you want me to give the guitar to?" So I look around. My buddy Steve Hazeltine is over there, and I felt like that was who the Lord was telling me to give it to. So I said, "Hey." come over here. I got his attention. He came over, went behind the stage, and I had my stuff there, and I, I said, hey, here's, here's my guitar. So I've had it since I was 16. I bought it at 16 years old from Guitar Center. Like this thing, I've had this a long time, but I feel like the Lord said to give it to you, and he's crying, and he's just like, oh my gosh, are you serious? I've been wanting, you know, he goes through the litany of what God has been speaking to him, and he takes the guitar, he leaves, and now it's like, okay, now it's shotgun time. Like, I gotta find out. Who, who do you give a gun to? Like, it, this could really go bad. <laughs> okay? So I go, I go out in my truck, and I pull, pull the rifle or the shotgun out, and I, I, I put it backstage, and I, I go back, and I'm worshiping, and I just, I'm, I'm praying, like, all right, Lord, who? And my buddy Chase is standing over there. I said, Chase, come here. And we go backstage, and I just pull it out, and I said, I feel like the Lord's telling me to give you this. I put the shotgun in his hand, and he kind of wells up with tears, and he said, I've been praying for years for a gun so that I could go out and hunt with you guys. And it was in that moment that God answered his prayer, right? I had no idea that was the case. I was just saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to be willing here. And finally the service ends, and I'm like, all right, that's truck time. I'm actually going to give my truck away. All right, hold it like this, hold it like this, hold it like this. Who do I give it to? The Lord says, Tom. Tom is my, basically my boss at that point. And I know his financial situation. He's always, you know, down in the dumps with money and whatever. And I walk up to him. I said, hey, Tom. I said, hold out your hand. He goes, what? I said, hold out your hand. Holds out his hands. I just took the keys and I dropped it in his hand. I said, there's your new truck. And now what happens in those moments is something that you can't really do justice explaining unless you've felt it. But what it is is peace that falls in your heart in that moment because what's happening is just, is just all I can say is just straight love going back and forth, whether you're on the receiving end or whether you're on the giving end. But now I have 
an angry little five-year-old to deal with. Dad, why did you give away our truck? Why? Because Jesus said so. No, Dad, why? Why? We can't go on the bumpy roads now. I, I know, but Jesus Jesus said to, to give the truck. I know, but we can't. And so it's just having this conversation back and forth. And so we had Jack and Chloe. And so every night for five months, one of the prayers that we would pray every night before they would go to bed was, and Jesus, give Dad a truck. And Jesus, did you give Dad a truck? Every night. So the SBS, the school that I staff ends, right? School that I staff ends, and we are driving in our Chevy Suburban uh, to Chicago to meet with supporters for the for the summer, um, which would be the winter here. Uh, and so we're driving, and I'm in western Minnesota. I'm probably about 12 hours away from home, and I get a call five months later, and it's Mrs. O from next door. Mrs. O'Donnell is going through a divorce. And her husband has had a very traumatic brain injury. Right before the brain injury, it was like the marriage was already on the rocks. And then this happened. And then it was hospital for months. And then it's training. And then he has to move to a warmer climate. So he moves down to Arizona. And now it's lawyers fighting. And it's, it's, it's a mess. The only thing they can agree on is that his old work truck, a 1994 uh, F250 7.3 liter turbo diesel extended cab, was they wanted to give it to me. And I said, I, I'm, I'm on the car, I'm in the car, on the phone, this is before you, it was illegal, and I'm like, are, are you serious? And she's like, yeah, we wanna, we wanna give it to you, so when you come down, just come by the house and I'll, get, I'll give you the keys, and I'll sign over the title. And so we got home, we, we, we drove, and we, we I, I don't think we stopped. I think we just kept driving. We got, we got home, it was like midday sometime. Jack and I got out of the car, we're so dead from that trip, because it's, like it's like a 27 hour drive. And we get all the way over, and we look at like this new truck, this new, this new to us F-250, and it's like, oh my goodness, God is so good. I never got another gun given to me. I never had another guitar given to me. But God did give me a truck. Okay? In that act of generosity, if I wouldn't have done that, I don't think I would have gotten a truck. A, a, and even a better one, five years newer. Now, why do I say that? Well, I say that because what he's saying here is the gift of generosity. There's so much generosity that's coming out of the first century church. I'll tell you one more story. When we left to come here in 2013, we were praying about how, how, how do you do that? How do you move a family of six, um, one of which, by the time we actually leave the base, is only three weeks old? How do you move a family of six with a three-week-old to Chicago, then to California, and then s land in Australia? Okay, that's just, I, that, that's crazy, Right? And what makes it even more crazy is that when we were praying about this whole thing, God said, don't sell anything. Okay, don't sell anything. Well, what else are you going to do with it? Because I can't take stuff overseas. Like, like, it just doesn't work. First of all, most of my stuff is crap. Second of all, you can't bring any wood into, like, I can't import any wood. And so it would just be a nightmare if we decided to bring anything. So it was like, well, we're going to give it away. So we went on a give -a -thon. Okay, couches, TV, TV stand, dishes, uh, two vehicles, my entire safe full of guns, uh, clothes, um, everything that we owned that we couldn't bring with us. Gave it away. You know what God did for us? He brought in $40,000 that we needed to make all of those trips and all of those plane, all those plane stops and whatever, to make it to Australia. When we moved to Australia, we moved into a furnished house. We were able to buy our first car here for two thousand dollars from a former or from a YWAMer who was just trying to get rid of it. And then we had another van given to us. 
Like God takes care of us, and we're we're I, we're here today. And I got to tell you one more story. All right. So I go down to Gold Coast. This was in 2019. This is before all the ever, all the COVID stuff hit. I'm in Gold Coast. It's probably like August, and I teach Bible overview. So I go from I have to teach Genesis to Revelation in five days, three hours a day. Okay, that's a challenge. Okay, where on the pond does the rock skip? <laughs> right? So that's what I get to do. And I'm down there, and we are, I'm, I'm teaching, teaching on giving. I'm teaching on just a whole slew of different things. And I close up the last, the last bit of the day, and I said, I said this. Uh, you know, I said, you know, thanks, guys. It's been a great time. I've really enjoyed this. And the school leader comes up and says, well, what we do is we, we pray for all of our speakers. She said, do you have any prayer requests? I said, yeah. I said, um, I, I, said I, need, I need wisdom for things that are happening around me right now. And we have a, uh, uh, our visas are coming due, and we have to pay $20,000 up front in order to, to stay here for another two years. So I need twenty grand. So she's like, okay. She prays. The whole school comes up. And I don't know if you've ever been someone that's been prayed for, but, like, when everybody's hand is on you, it's actually really heavy. <laughs> Pushes you down. And so they prayed, and they're praying and whatever. And so I, I'm coming up, and I'm, like, closing up my book bag, and it's actually this book bag, and I'm putting stuff in it. And this 19-year-old comes up and says, um, how much did you say you needed? And I said, well, I needed uh, I need 20. It's basically like 19, 5, 19 and change because we put 500 down, and I kind of go through this little spiel on because it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to say what you need. I, I need $20,000 in order to stay here. I need God to show up or I'm going home. Like that's, that's the way it is. He goes, oh, I have 18. I said, what are you saying? So this guy, goes, I, I, I have, you know, before, you know, I, I left high school and I worked for a while before I came to DTS and I was able to save $18,000. And I saved that, and I was, I was going to either, you know, put it as a down payment for a house or buy a car with it, but I wanted to go to something eternal. You want about just getting smoked by the Lord. Holy cow. Like, I just, like, I just instantly had tears rolling down my face. I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yes. Yeah. So, like, for the next hour, we're sitting there, and you're trying to do a bank transfer. Turns out people don't, <laughs> banks don't like it when you transfer that much cash. So I needed 19 and change. By the time a week later, after the la when it finalized, after it cleared, I had f it was fifty bucks over after you you did the the, the exchange rate. God gave us twenty thousand dollars so that we could stay here until March of twenty two. Okay, that's how God works. So what's our job? Our job is to walk in generosity, right? And our job is to be praying for the things that we need. And it's God's job to bring it to us. So I imagine that all of you have needs. I guarantee you, if I opened the mic up right now and said, what do you need from the Lord financially, like physically? I mean, the list would be a mile long. Okay? So we're going to walk in the opposite spirit. We're going to pray and the prayer that we're going to pray is, Lord, what do you want me to give away? Because God says, give, and it will be given to you. Press down, running over, with the full measure you use, it will be given back to you. Luke 6.38. Look at, I, seriously, write down Luke 6.38 on your card. And now this is what I want you to do, and we're going to close with this. I want, I'm going to pray right now. And what I'm going to pray is that God would be speaking to you over this next week about what he wants you to give away. Now, I've told you some, some crazy stories. It might be something as simple as when you and your friend go to the coffee bar that you pick up the tab. Or when you and your friend go out to dinner, you pick up the dinner tab. You pay for your friend's meal. That might be all that you can do. Or maybe it's just, you know what, this week I'm going to tithe 1% more than I did last time. 
I'm not asking for something ridiculous and stupid. I'm saying, where, wh what could you do that you didn't do last week, but it's going to take at least a little bit of faith to do net for next week? What can I give away? So, Lord, I just pray right now that you would bring up to mind money numbers. I pray that you would bring up things in houses, in their houses, things that are owned, that they can freely give. You are a God of generosity. You gave your son, Jesus, you didn't, or God, you didn't hold anything, you didn't hold anything back. You gave us this world. Every breath we take is a gift. You love it when we walk in generosity. And God, I pray that we can be people who are marked by glad and generous hearts. Because people that are marked by glad and generous hearts see amazing things happen in their lives. So just with your eyes closed, heads bowed, what is that thing? It can be big, it can be small. And it's not about that. David gave 300 plus billion dollars, yet Jesus in Mark chapter 12 is sitting there looking at the offering bin. People are dumping huge sums of money and this poor, poor woman comes in. She puts two copper coins that make a penny. And Jesus says that that woman gave more than all of the others because all the others gave out of their abundance where this woman gave out of her poverty. And that was all she had to live on. Jesus picked her out of the crowd saying, that's, that's what I want to see. So, Lord, I just pray that whatever you're saying, that we would hear. And that whatever we hear, that we would actually act on. In your name we pray. Amen. Any questions? Over to you. Thanks, JD. Um, whew, yeah. Lord bless you guys. Hey, and um, the challenge that we've received tonight, keep that on the burner. Don't go from here and forget about it. Um, Take that card somewhere, put it somewhere where you're going to be able to see it and be reminded. And as the Lord gives you the answers to those questions, what and where uh, is he calling us, you, to be generous? Um, write it down and then follow through. Let's, um, let's thank JD again tonight.